All good? Okay, all good. Uh, okay. We are finishing, finally, this book. We decided we began, I believe, last, uh, um, like, early, late September, early October. I forgot exactly the date we started. But finally, we are leaving this book. And what a study this one has been. How many things we learned about ourselves as we kind of looked, appeared uh, in the life of the church in Corinth. We now know how easily uh, selfishness or, or self-centeredness come to surface in, in so many various forms or shapes, uh, like pride and division and so on. We know how hard it was for them and actually probably for any church today to maintain unity when the flesh sometimes receives more obedience than the spirit. And we saw in their lives how damaging or pernicious, how bad it was when sin ignored became sin accepted. And still, Paul calls them saints. I love this, how the book starts with his words. Yep. You know, he says, you are the ones, let's see, the church of God in Corinth, to those, who, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. Paul saw beyond their current problems, the many, many of, of, of which he will address in this uh, 16 chapters, and he calls them saints because God does not evaluate them, and by God's grace us as well, on our performance. But God looks at us through grace and through Jesus, through the cross of Jesus. We stand on this grace and we stand because, because of the ministry of Jesus as a high priest, and we stand because of the Holy Spirit that is with us and in us. He still corrects them along the way, quite a lot of times, actually. He, a couple of times he says, to your shame. I, I mean, probably he's not, I don't think he's wigging. Well. He was doing, not doing this with a finger, but he does say uh, twice at least, I say this to your shame. He's very direct with them, but so gracious at the same time. He knows these are the saints of God. And at the end of this book, in a somewhat typical manner, Paul is addressing a bunch of miscellaneous topics. Sundry, it's a new word I learned. It's an old word, but I learned this new word, sundry topics, you know, miscellaneous. And in the middle of, the, of, this, of this chapter, he drops probably the last major encouragement and command, which is this. We'll come back to this at the end of the message. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act. Act like men actually means act with courage. We'll go back to this in a second. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's, in a way, probably the heaviest of the commands, not just of this chapter, probably one of the major themes of the book. But let's take it step by step before we get there. The first passage is about the collection for the saints. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collection when I, collecting when I come. And it continues. So what happens here? Paul, in his ministry, wherever he went in, uh, in this area of the world, he asked for a collection for donations for the struggling churches. And at this time, the most struggling one was one in Jerusalem. Persecution came upon them. It was hard to be a Christian in Jerusalem. The Jews and the Romans equally were coming hard on the Christians. And there was isolation. When you are the only one who is a Christian in a city full of very hard and radical Jews, you become isolated. As a Christian, you couldn't do business with some of the Romans or the Greeks. And now the Jews were casting you out of the synagogues. It was hard. And of course, because of uh, persecution and isolation, poverty was, was, was common amongst the churches. So Paul wants them to be blessed. And he brings uh, these gifts from the churches in, in uh, Galatia and Macedonia to the church in Jerusalem. You know, a couple of things we don't, we don't want to spend too much more, too much time here. It was on the first day of the week. It's one of those small hints. It's not a proof, but it's a hint that shows us the church in those days was meeting not on the Sabbath, not on Saturday, but on Sunday, which was the first day of the week, which uh, custom which we all uh, keep until today. And I love how he says, they should all give as, as he or she may prosper. You know, it was not a fixed amount. I want you guys to give Jenny, I want, or Janet, I want you guys to give a thousand bucks. And I want Fred to give two thousand bucks. And Fiona, ah, we'll forget Fiona. 
No, it was, guys, you decide how much to give. I'm not telling you how much. You choose based on what God has given you as a gift, and you give as worship. And that's, part, that's probably one of, the, one of the most beautiful images of what our tithe and offerings or gifts in the church are. It's not a tax. You know, I probably told you this before, but as a Romanian, growing up, the word tithe was seen as a uh, four little, four, it was a bad word. Because back in the day, the tithe was collected by force. There were soldiers with whips and weapons collecting, going through villages and by force collecting tithe. Can you see, can you imagine this? You know, so when I, when I became a Christian, uh, when I heard the church is taking tithe, I was like, you know, I was taken aback because I was, oh, you're doing that? Because I, all, all I thought was a forcefully taken tithe, uh, um, tax. But then I learned what worship is and thanksgiving and gratefulness and to give because you've been given so much and all my mindset was changed. And this is what we have here. Give as you may prosper. Give as God gave you and give as worship. You know, as a, for, for the brethren who are, in, who are struggling, look around and share the blessings of those who are less blessed than you. You know, as a theme here is be generous. I know you are. I know this church is generous. I'm not, I'm not, I'm preaching at the choir. And that's a, thing, uh, a phrase we might use here. You know, I continue, let's put it this way, continue to be generous. As God has prospered you, give to others. It is okay to plan to give for ministry and missions. It is okay to give because needs are plenty. Everywhere you look, there are needs. So because of this, pray to know where to direct your funds. You know, pray. I mean, tithe. normally what we say, which is not a law, okay, it's a, it's a guideline. Tithe to the church and give offerings or gifts wherever you want on top of that. Does it make sense? You know, so that's a guideline. Of course, this is not a law. We're not going by the law, but the point is be generous. As you have been given, give to others. And a small observation here. Oh, I, I said that before. It's uh, the first of the week was uh, the meetings of Christians and on, on Sundays. Okay, so be generous is the first thought. Paul is asking the church to examine their hearts and to give as God has given them. The second thing is, be involved. You know, as we look through these next, uh, next few verses, think about the involvement of churches and Paul and others in the ministry in the whole region. He says these words, you know, it's basically, it's basically it's his travel plans. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I, stay, I will stay in Ephesus un, until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective ministry has opened to me, and there are many adversary. You know, so as you see this, and not just this, you go through end of book of Romans. Uh, most of the ends of books, Paul gives these greetings that shows how much ministry was, was like this. Town to town and church to church, it was done together. You know, ministry was done through the, old, the whole empire in a way, <clears throat> sorry, living, uh, living out, yes, living out Acts 1 8. Remember Acts 8, 1 8? And uh, you will be my messengers, you know, in Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and to the end, till the ends of the, uh, ends of the earth. So this is the ends of the earth for, well, not quite, but it's beyond the empire. You know, for us, when we think of that area, it's like, it's small. You can travel, you know, within an hour, fly from, from one to the other end, you know, maybe two hours from Spain to Turkey. But for them, that was to the end of the, or, and end of the world, you know. And Rome was the perfect empire. By the way, you know how God ordained the perfect time and the perfect, perfect place? Because Rome, as a military empire, they built a lot of good roads. There are still, in Romania, there are still roads built by Romans who are still in use today. Small, in small areas. But we still have roads built by the Romans in Romania when they conquered us. Yeah, so eh, maybe not the happiest of moments, but they did conquer us in uh, 105, 106. But those roads throughout the empire led, I mean, were an effective tool for Paul to travel wherever he has a need, especially now he, was, he, was, he would be uh, heading towards Rome in, in, not a, in a short time. So just a small observation, not really uh, very spiritual, but God 
used the Roman Empire and its engineers to allow Paul to travel easily through the empire, which is, I don't know, it's, for me, it's awesome. And of course, it's a collaboration. The church there in Corinth, with the church in Macedonia, with the churches everywhere, they work together. They help Paul, Paul teaches them, then goes to Ephesus, and so on and so forth. And you think this is amazing Christian tourism. Paul gets to visit Turkey. Paul gets to visit, I mean, Turkey. we know it was not Turkey back then, it's Turkey today. Goes to Greece and goes to Italy. I mean, I wish I had someone, someone, such a vacation like this. You know, easy times, you know, just go from Airbnb to Airbnb, just uh, spend your mornings in, uh, in Starbucks with your coffee in your laptop and just do your devotionals there and then go teach over Zoom to, no, no such thing. Read these words. The door, a wide door for ministry in uh, Ephesus was open for me, and there are many adversaries. Exactly. Paul was actually running towards trouble. He was not running away from trouble. He was running towards trouble. And that it, that, it was, this is something that really was a major factor in his ministry. Read Rome, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, most of the chapter, about how was the ministry of Paul was no, no such thing as Christian tourism. It was prison time, famine, fasting, beating, almost dead a few times, shipwrecked, what, at least once, if not more than once. You know, that was heart, Paul's heart. If there's a door for ministry, I'm going to go there no matter what the risks are. I say this in, in the world, especially the Western world today, which is so risk averse. We hate risk. We don't see a point in suffering, and we forget that suffering and risk-taking were the tools God used to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We somehow today forgot that comfort is not a, I would say, comfort can so easily become a, an idol. Comfort and security can become today's golden cow, golden something, golden calf, calf, the thing, you know, you know what I mean. So ministry keeps going even though it gets tough. So be generous, be involved, you know, take risks. And then the third part, again, I told you it's, it's a bunch of miscellaneous things that Paul says at the end now. And he says, now be hospitable. You know, as ESL, I had so much hard time with this because I always said be hospital. But it was, I was corrected. It was not quite the right say, way to say it. You know, it's, we're not hospitals, we're hospitable. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. And now concerning Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Okay, so we have here what we call Christian charity. Christian hospitality, Christian love put in action, you know? And I love, I, I found this quote in a book I read for school this, this uh, past couple of weeks. How do we serve God? It's a very easy answer. How do we serve Jesus? By serving people. It's simple. It's no rocket science. We serve God by serving people. And Paul is uh, calling the church to live God's charity, God's love, like this. Saying, I mean, not saying this, but this is a principle. I am a servant. I am a servant of Christ. I serve God by serving people. That's that's the dominant attitude in God's in Paul's heart, and he's teaching the church, churches to do the same. You know, with Timothy, put him at ease. Whatever that means, put him at ease. You know, it's. I wonder what was happening with Timothy. Probably his timidity, because we know he was not the most bold guy. Uh, I don't know, but he says, guys, when he comes, put him at ease, you know? I remember my first Sunday here at Bridal Town was in August of 2016, and it was, I became nervous. I missed the road. I, 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 I turned left at uh, First Alliance, and I was like, oh, where I am? But uh, when I came here, it was, you know, it was, it was awesome. I think it was, Ron was still here. Uh, Pat was still here. Those are the two people I remember, Ron and Pat, and of course, Steve. <laughs> But I, I loved the love of this church that gave to me from day one. Even though I was just a, what we call a pulpit supply guy, just some guy random who'd come and preach on a few Sundays. 
but still their love was was without borders it put me at ease and it says do not do not despise him why would they despise him mostly because his youthfulness that was the only reason people might bring against him it was his youthfulness you know who are you to teach me anything I mean, one of the things I appreciate about being 54 is that at this age, I kind of have enough life experience to have the tenure to say things, to, to give advice to people. But when I was 25 or 24, one, I had no experience, but two, I looked young. I would look, I, I was 24, I would look, I looked like 18, you know, so, you know, blessing and a curse if I'm quoting a movie now. But, um, I wouldn't say people despised me, but it was hard to actually be taken seriously when you look so childish at that age. So I don't know what Timothy, but God says, I mean, Paul says to, uh, to the church, welcome him, put him at ease, do not despise him, help him on his way. You know, so basically live out Christian love, Christian charity with him, you know. And I love this. He is doing God's work as I am. He kind of lends his credentials if you want to Timothy. I do God's work, he does God's work. You receive me, receive him as well. We're equally God's servants. You know, and that's a winning attitude uh, for, for Paul to encourage those around him to continue to serve. It's not like Paul is here, Timothy is here. It was, we are co-workers. As you receive me, receive him as well. And now the next passage, you know, was be generous, be hospitable, this one is kind of kind of odd. Is I called it uh, the section "Be obedient" or "Be subject." Is on the screen now. I urge you, brothers. Yep. Now I urge you, brothers, and I'm going to skip until verse 16. Be subject to such as these, which was the household of Stephanus, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they were. They have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Two commands here. I urge you to be subject to Stephanus and those like him and give them recognition. There's something special that Paul shows us, and the scriptures at large, God shows us, about attitude towards those who are leading us in the church. And not because he wants to elevate them on a pedestal because we're not holier than thou we're not better than you but there is an honor sorry a burden that comes with this position of a church leader whatever name you want to give it i love the way uh hebrews 13 says in verse 17 obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that, you, that would be of no advantage to you. That's verse 17 of chapter 13 of, of Hebrews. Same ideas here. Give honor, or give recognition to such people, Stephanus and others like him, and be subject to them. It's, it's about order in worship, order in the church of God, and respecting God's authority through these people. You know, it's honor, recognition, hospitality, as part of day-to-day -day ministry of each church. So be, gen be generous, be hospitable, and now be obedient. Obey the leaders of the church. We're skipping two verses. I told you, actually, we skipped them already. And we go to the final greetings. And I call this section, don't go at it alone. One of the worst mistakes uh, youth, uh, uh, anyone can do in the church of God is to try to attempt great things for God by themselves. Paul, if you read these verses, and not just this, uh, this and Romans, uh, Romans will be 16 chapter of Romans, you see how, how wide the connection of Paul was and how many people walked alongside Paul. If you think of King David, you have this image that King David served as a king and fought, bear, um, fought wars by himself. But we know he had mighty men of valor around him that always were there for him, had generals and soldiers that loved him and obeyed him and worked to give fought together with him. And Paul here, he has people, not just himself, that they do ministry together. A few names are mentioned. We had um, Timothy, um, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Archaicus, and now we have more names. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, or Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. 
All the brothers and send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. And I, I will stop here for now. You know, this is the beauty of the work of God, that we are the body of Christ and we need one another. Remember the main theme of chapter 14? I, I, yeah, I, I won't keep you, uh, I, I won't hold you accountable for this, but it was this, no one is self-sufficient, no one is useless. Actually, I put it, I put it the other way around. No one is useless because everyone has something to give in the spirit. And no one is self-sufficient. We all need one another. And this is the, if you read this in Romans 16, the whole chapter, you see how many, how many great people Paul had around him. I had the grace to have a mentor back in Romania in my early days as, as a Christian, Dan Clements. He's a pastor in some town in South Carolina right now, but um, Apex, South Carolina, North Carolina, one of them. And um, he kept saying these things as a bragging. He said, God gave me success in ministry because God surrounded me with high quality people. He told that to me and to my coworkers and to our team. He kept saying this, I have success because God gave me you, you know, and you are high quality people. That is the reason I seem to be successful. And it was honoring to us. He wasn't bossing it over us. He wasn't showing off with our, he was just said, if I seem to be someone or something, it's because God gave me you as my gift. The same with this church. Do you think I, I, I do everything in this church? No. I do the teaching part of it, but this ministry is held together by each, by each and every one of you who volunteers and contributes. And we need one another because no one is... Lord, remind me. <laughs> no one is useless. And no one is self-sufficient. We are the body of Christ. You know, we have home churches. You know, we have Aquila and Priscilla teaching the house, the church in their house. We have brothers sending greetings. We have this, you know, greet each other with a holy kiss. Be, show love even physically if, if that is uh, a possibility in, in your culture. Go to Russia, it's three times. You know, Romania it's twice. You know, depending on the culture. Here it's like none, it's like, you know. Uh, <laughs> It, it, there's nothing, nothing bad in this, you know. I, I guess I'm not. I, I don't know about Armenians or uh, uh, Iranians or whatever, but I know some cultures have this custom to greet with a holy kiss, which is just a, a beautiful way of physical touch, showing care through physical touch. Anyway, uh, this chapter, this section reflects the fact that something we tend to forget. Paul was never a lone ranger. He was not afraid of the successes of people around him. The sign of, a, of an immature and insecure leader is when I am afraid of those that are better than me. I would be happy and blessed, and I am happy and blessed because God brought in our church people who are in many ways better than me, and that I will never be ashamed or afraid of this kind of people. And I pray that God brings you know, more, much more of this. And verse 22 is kind of odd. Amongst all this, um, is it on the screen? It must be. Yeah, 22 is on the screen. Amongst all these blessings and thank yous and whatever, comes this verse. Oops. Yeah, it's here. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Or anathema is the Greek word. Our Lord, come. Maranatha. Why on earth did Paul put this there? If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Well, let me remind you of what we, we know. This is war. This is war. The second you said yes to Jesus, you became a soldier in the Lord's army. And you became a target of the enemy. And our faith is the one that's on the line. And we need to know this clearly, that in the church, it's not always easy. Things are hard sometimes, and people, people are most often the tools the devil uses against us. And Paul say, you know, look around and clearly see who has love for God, who has not. And those who have no love for God, let them be accursed or let them be anathema. And Paul does not mean the unbelievers that might be, you know, coming to church, you know, to visit. It's not about unbelievers, but also those in the church who fake it for some personal reasons. 
you know, and they create chaos at the believers and heartache to the apostles by bringing wrong teachings, apostasy, and uh, heresy in the church. Paul says, let them be anathema. Keep the church, God's church, the pure church of Christ. I love this word. It ends there with, I mean, this verse ends with, uh, our Lord come. The same words that John uses at the end of the Revelation when it says, uh, Jesus come. In, in, in that would be Aramaic, it was Maranatha. Some of you seeing this word, Maranatha. I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Maranatha would be in Romanian. You know, but this, it means Lord come. It is an, an, a yearning of the soul that says, I want to see Christ. This world is full of trials, but one day our Lord will come. And this is a prayer. Our Lord, come. Appropriate ending for this uh, for this uh, phrases for this uh, teachings here, our expectation for Christ's return, our groaning in our hearts and our hope in Him. But let's go now to, if I can say this, the meat of this passage. You know, I left them for the end because I feel that this makes an amazing ending or final exhortation for the church in Corinth and for us. Let me read them: Be watchful, stand firm in faith, act like men or act with courage, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Paul starts his verses with this. Be watchful. Why? Because there are some that are anathema, that are accursed in your midst. The church has dangers within and dangers without. Just in Corinth, just as in Corinth, there are tensions from outside, Romans and Greeks and, and Jews and whatever, but the dangers within, which is uh, wrong theology, wrong beliefs, or people who just fake it for some personal benefits. The flesh, the devil, and the world are trying to make the church ineffective in God's work. And Paul says, be watchful, for none of us is better or holier than the Christians in Corinth. This is for us too. We need to be watchful, for none of us is better or holier than the church in Corinth. Keep watch over yourselves and keep watch over the church of God. And stand firm in Christ. Remember, it reminded me of, of Corinthians, uh, not Corinthians, sorry, Ephesians 6, 11. Stand firm in faith, you know? Stand after you learned that this is a battle of the Lord. Stand firm in faith, you know? Faith is what? What was preached, what you believed, what is in Christ the Lord. That is your faith. Christ is the Lord. Be watchful, stand firm in faith. And then this part, I'm going to call it act with courage. I know it's act like men. I love this one we teach men. Men's breakfast or men's conference is great to say act like men because it's in the Bible. But for us as a church, it actually means act with courage. Attempt great things for God. For God is a great God. And I said it in the beginning, be courageous. Take risks. Do not make comfort and security our modern day idols. Act with courage and step out in faith. Be strong. Strong spiritually, strong in the power of his mind. Strong because it is not you. It is him in you that gives the power to stay strong. I love this ending. Let all, that, let all be done. Let all that you do be done in love. What do we do? We serve coffee in love. We put chairs in love. We visit people in love. We make phone calls in love. We write emails in love. We donate food in love. We encourage in love. We counsel in love. We cry with one another in love. We laugh together in love. We are the body of Christ, united by what? Simply, the love of Christ. You know, and there's, there's something special here because it's not a human sentiment. Actually, this kind of love is, is supernatural. It is not natural. It does not come naturally. Every morning, not every morning, many mornings when I wake up, whenever I remember, I pray this, Lord, help me be gracious, kind, and loving. Because I know my human nature is none of those things. By nature, I, I'm not gracious. By nature, I'm not kind. By na my nature, I'm not loving but I do want to be all those three things. And that can only be done in Christ and through his power. I don't know who are you, or where you are today, but this is exactly why we are in church. Because here we hear what we call the good news. God can change our hearts. When, we're we, when we were unkind, ungracious, if that's a word, 
and unloving, God changed us. Christ Jesus, who was prophesied. Prophets in the, in the in year, many years, many thousands of years ago prophesied about him. And he came. He lived a life amongst us. And he suffered and he died for us because he loved us. And then he, he rose again. And guess what? He's coming back. Oh, Lord, come. Because of this gospel, because of, because of this news of Christ dying for our sins and being rose again, risen again, being, coming back to life again for us, we can have love through him. We don't say, Lord, make me, how say, allow me more strength to try harder, to love harder. No, it's like love. Sorry, God, you live through me. I am dead, but you are alive in me. This is the kind of love we're talking about. How do we make this personal? What were many of the, some of the sins they were struggling with? Pride, self-centeredness, disunity, spiritual, compla spiritual complacency. What was Paul's solution for them? Everything that you do, do it in love. Let the Spirit of God be in you and with you and put His love in your hearts every day. So how do we respond to this whole chapter, or actually the whole letter of Corinthians first, 1 Corinthians? How do we love our family in Christ? This is what ties actually this section together. It is not, you know, this miscellaneous random things. There is actually a theme, and the theme is love. How do I love my brothers and sisters in God's family? Well, I love by being generous with my money. It's not, actually, it sounds even worse, uh, not, it sounds bad to say my money, when I know that this is not mine, it is his in the first place. So be love by being generous financially to those who, are, who have physical needs. Love by showing hospitality. Love the saints of God. We're praying for, to eventually to own a home in Canada, but we, we don't want to, uh, you know, when, I'm assuming we're, we'll be empty nesters soon. We don't want a one bedroom, something small. We want, a, we want at least two bedrooms. You know why? Because we want to have guests. And, of course, Anna needs a room for me when I snore too hard to be, have a place to go when I snore too much. But that's secondary. Main is, we want a place to receive guests. We, we dream of the day when we can host and have people come and sleep in our home. I mean, they're sleeping today, but, you know, we want to continue this in our own personal home in the future. So be generous. Love by being generous. Love by being hospitable. Love by growing in love. Let everything you do be done in love. You know, love all, show the love practice, show your love practically to those around you. Love the church by submitting to its authority. And I want to, I don't want to, you know, make my job easier here or look, Hebrews kind of say that, says that in Hebrews 13, 17, but I want you guys to show that a part of loving God is loving his body and obeying or be submitted, submitting, being submissive to the leaders of the church, assuming leadership is godly and honorable and servant leadership, not, you know, a bossy kind of leadership. You know, we're talking about the proper servant, servant, servant hearted leadership. Love by showing affection to your brothers and sisters. You know, greet them, love them, show them that you care, show them they're not just a number or just a project. And love by waiting his return. Do we, do we yearn with this, Lord, come? Lord, please come. I want you, I need you. I want to see that day when I hear the trumpet and when I, I hear the call and I'm, I'll be home with you. And you'll say to me, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Maranatha, O Lord, come. Remember, this is not, we do not love in our own strength. We love because God has given us this kind of love. Romans 8.13, I could be wrong, but I think it's 8.13, says that his love has been poured into our hearts by the Spirit. His love has been poured into our lives by the Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have access to all this strength, to love, all this, all this potential, to love God, to love people, and to do everything in love, and to be strong, and to be watchful, and to guard the church of Christ. Because why? Because you love it. If you love someone, you guard, you watch over this. 
And this love is not a human resource. I end with this and say, it is all because of the good news. God saw us in our sins and sent his son to die and to be raised again for us so that we can today have a high priest who intercedes for me and you, the only one that can do this. And he's doing, he's doing it in love for us. And he says, I want to give you this kind of love. I want this church to be a loving church. And then and Paul ends this chapter and this book. Paul as a shepherd, Paul as a teacher, Paul as an apostle, Paul as an evangelist. He knows that the essence is believe in Christ, love God, and love people. Let's pray.